Hi, I'm Clark on Temptress. Today I'm going to explain how to charge lithium iron phosphate batteries the right way. This is a lithium iron phosphate battery. It looks like a lead battery. It's in the same case a lead battery was often in. It's a different animal different animal altogether. So in this video, I'm going to talk about how to charge these and how they're very different from an electrical point of view than a lead battery is. This is a video I've been wanting to do for over a year. It's a very complicated subject. Um, I had to read a lot of very esoteric white papers to really understand how this thing works. The problem is we're being told the wrong information by the battery companies. Uh, I know that sounds all tinfoil hatty, but basically there are no charge controllers out there, well, barring mine, I'll get into that later, that can charge these things properly. And if you're trying to sell batteries and you were to define how they have to be charged correctly, you wouldn't be able to sell batteries because nobody could charge them. Uh, I think that's why. Anyway, today I'm gonna to talk about how to charge these beasts, how they're different, and how we can really get the best life out of them. There's another YouTube channel called Engineering Explained, and I've been watching his stuff for a long time. It's very automotive, and he'll get into like new engine design and such. But recently he put out a really good video, and a lot of my viewers have recommended it to me, though I'd already seen it. Um, it's about how to charge the newer cars that have lithium iron phosphate batteries, not the older lithium ion uh, type batteries and um, how to get the right life out of them and how they're just a little different. Now his video is all about cars and his video is about, you know, having the grid available so you just plug it into the wall whenever you want and charge at any rate you want. And honestly, there's another huge thing. His video is about systems that know how many amps are really going into the, the um, batteries. In the case of a car, all of them, because if you're actually using the car, you know, you don't have a long enough cord. Um, I'm gonna be talking about how to charge them in an off-grid environment, an active being used off-grid environment. Uh, what you'd find on a camper, on a boat, and like in a house. The big difference there is we try to rely on the sun. You know, that's kind of the point, right? Get off the grid. And the sun charges at various rates throughout the day as the sun moves over the panel, angle change, all that. And also, of course, clouds. On top of that, your system is using power while you're charging. So you may be charging at 20 amps, but suddenly your fridge comes on and sucks up five of that. The battery is only seeing 15. So we have a very dynamic world to deal with that he doesn't have to do deal with. But I highly recommend you watch his video. There are sure to be things that he has covered that I don't cover or don't cover as well. Um, I think these two videos go together for the off-grid world uh, pretty well. Technically, we're not charging the battery. We're charging the cells in the battery. And for 12 volt battery, that means four cells. Uh, for higher voltage, that's more cells. But I'm not gonna make myself go insane by giving you the cell voltages all through this. I'm gonna give you the voltages based on a 12 volt battery. So two things. If you're using 24, just multiply everything I say by two. If you're using 48, multiply everything I say by four. And it's vital for all of this to work absolutely perfectly that the cells are all equalized. And that's the responsibility of the BMS. I'll go into that more in the future in this video, but, um, we're going to make the assumption that they're all balanced for this discussion. Otherwise, life just gets too confusing with caveats. Before I dive into how to charge lithium, let's do something a little more familiar. Let's just do a quick recap of how we charge lead. Lead's a very different animal. Um, lead batteries are just a cup of sulfuric acid with some lead plates in them. And they're very simplistic devices. They don't have a BMS actively doing magic in there. But what's more important from a charging point of view is they are tough. Um, not only can you abuse them, uh, technically it might be good to occasionally abuse them on purpose. The method of equalizing the cells in a lead battery is to actually overcharge the battery as a group um, beyond where it should be charged for a good long life and letting that low cell come up and catch up. 
that is not how you would want to do it to a lithium battery because you truly would destroy the other cells. So, how do we charge a lead battery? The correct way to charge the lead battery would be to charge it, aiming for a voltage. And of course, the charge source can't put out infinite power, so the lead battery itself will hold the voltage down as you're trying to pump power into it. And the voltage will come up and come up and come up. So when it comes up to the target voltage, you hold it there uh, by lowering the current. And you just keep lowering the current and lowering the current as the battery gets more charged and the voltage will stay right where it was. You keep going until the current number comes down to 1% of the amp hour ratings. So the amp rate coming in is 1% of the amp hour rating of the battery. So if you had a 100 amp hour battery, when you get one amp flowing in to hold that voltage up, that battery's charged. That's not how it's done. Um, when electronics came out that were capable of that in the 90s, several companies made really good chargers that could do it just that way. Um, lately, nobody's doing I, When I say nobody, people can come up with one little exception, but they're not the big selling ones, you know? Uh, the Victrons of the world don't do that. All they do is they charge up to that voltage and they start a timer. And then a certain amount of time goes by and they try to hold it there. And then uh, when the timer's up, then they come down and go into the full voltage and basically they're done charging. This isn't a great idea because if you charge a battery up and then like shut off the charge source, say shut off your engine, your alternator, restart the engine, it will go through an entire time again. And uh, that's overcharging the battery but lead is tough. It'll take it, so it's not the first thing that's gonna kill your batteries, and it's okay, it's okay. How you should get a long service life out of a lead battery is to routinely charge it to full. I mean, you shouldn't let a couple of days go by where it doesn't come up to full during the day. Uh, the people who let their batteries go down and down and down and then only bring it up a bit and a bit, they're the ones that get the very short life out of lead batteries. I personally had batteries on Temptress last like 13 and 15 years um, because I charge them very well and I do some other things, but um, they can last a fairly long amount of time. The problem is that's very difficult to do because as lead gets more and more charged, it just won't take in power very quickly. So you have to charge for an extremely long period of time at very low current rates to, to get them to top off. Eh, that's a pain in the off-grid environment. If you're going to do this on grid, you know, you plug them in and, you know, let the mains do the work. But we only have so much sun in the day, right? You should not ever discharge your deep cycle lead batteries below 50% charge. The deeper you go, the shorter their total life will be. Um, that goes in spades, double, triple, 100% for the thin cell uh, batteries, the thin plate batteries that we start our engines with. They shouldn't cycle at all. They should just start the engine and then be recharged right away, just like it's done in a car. And finally, you'd want to store lead at 100% charged. You don't want to store it down a bit. If you overcharge a lead battery, you put power into it beyond the point where it's 100% charged, the battery itself intrinsically has ways of dealing with that. Uh, one way is it has a fairly large internal resistance that seems to go up as it goes up in charge. So if you overcharge it, it just plain makes heat in the battery and that heat it goes out into the environment. If you don't go crazy, you won't cause a problem. And there is a way of dissipating that heat. Um, also, it can get rid of a lot of energy by converting the water that's in the electrolyte into hydrogen and oxygen. Um, again, not a big deal because if you have a flooded battery, you can just pour the water right back in. And if you have a sealed battery that you can't re-add uh, the water, they've already solved that problem for you, at least to some extent. They have a catalyst inside the battery that will actually mix the hydrogen and oxygen gases back together into water. It drips back into the battery all as well. That releases the heat, the energy, so the battery will get hotter but as long as you don't go crazy, there are systems to take care of it. The short is, a lead battery can be charged beyond 100%, put more power in it, and it'll just make heat and not hurt its chemistry. Lithium is another animal altogether. Um, let's do it backwards. Number one, it doesn't have that ability. If you charge them to 100%, it's actually really good up to 100%. It'll just take what you give it. It's so much easier to charge lithium batteries. Power comes right in. 
But once they go over 100%, you'll notice that the, um, the voltage will go up. It's called the hockey stick. I'll draw that out in a second. But when it starts going up in the hockey stick, pushing that voltage up, the current has to go somewhere. It still is energy. And if the current is flowing into the battery, it has to do something to get rid of. Heat isn't really a big ability of the lithium batteries. Yeah, anything will make heat if you push it hard enough, but that's not what it does that's a problem. What it does, apparently, from the white papers I've read, is it takes some of the free lithium ions. They should be part of a salt, but it's an ionic salt. That's why it works. And they're running around doing their ionic tricks moving power. That's what we want them to do. Well, when they're not available to move power and charge the battery anymore, another chemical reaction happens. And that other chemical reaction actually bonds the lithium together into lithium metal. And that's a one-way reaction. Now, there's a lot of salt in there, so that lithium metal happening bit by bit, you won't notice it, but it will shorten the life of the battery. Think of it as like drinking too much beer. You do it on occasion, we know it kills brain cells, but eh, you know, you got lots of them. You do it every day, your entire life. Well, you know that guy when he's 60 years old. So let's go to that curve real quick. Okay, so a lithium battery would look like this. If this is a percent of charge, 100%, and uh, whoop, let's go a little beyond 100%, and 0%. Uh, and this is voltage, and I'm just gonna say high and low. If you charge a lead battery, you'll see something sort of like this. The voltage will just go up, 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 and up. Um, it's pretty linear. It's not perfectly linear, but compared to lithium, it's really linear. Lithium is different. The battery voltage will go up very quickly, and then it'll level right off, almost level, until it hits 100%, and then it'll go up in what we call the hockey stick. And we call this the hockey stick because, hey, look at it. There's two of them, one at the low and one at the high. It's in this hockey stick area where damage happens. But two criteria have to be met for the damage to happen. One is there has to be no place for the power to go chemically anymore. So it does the bad chemical reaction. And number two is a certain activation energy has to be available. This won't happen at really low voltages, even if the battery is 100% charged and you were to pump some power into it for a tiny amount of time, no harm, no foul. Of course, if you keep it up, the voltage will go up and, and you'll be in the activation energy. That activation energy for a 12 volt lithium iron phosphate bank is 13.48 uh, volts. So you wanna keep the batteries below 13.48 volts. If you're done charging them and you charged harder because that was appropriate, you really like to bring the voltage right down right after the charge is over. Uh, put that in your pocket, we'll get back to that later. So because of this flat middle part of the curve, almost nothing can be done based on voltage um, of a lithium iron phosphate battery. Uh, with lead, if you let them rest for a little while, the voltage will come to this curve and you can say, ah, that's the voltage, I'm 50% charged. Look at lithium. From here to here, it's virtually the same voltage. You just can't do that. You also simply can't charge them to a voltage. Let me say that again, because that's what every product is doing right now. You can't safely, correctly, charge a lithium iron phosphate battery to a voltage. Because that voltage, there's just so much more involved in it. And I'm just gonna say it simply, that voltage is a target that's moving. If you grab a, like a Victron charger and you set it for lithium, the question he asks you is, oh, what voltage should I charge to, sir? The reason they don't fill in the blank is because there is no right answer. If you are charging hard and fast at like 0.5C, uh, half the rating of the battery's amp hours in amps, the correct answer is charge up to 14.6 if you want to. If you're charging at like 0.1C or 0.01C, you should shut off the charging at like 13.7, 13.8. And there's a lot more to it than just amps and volts. There's just a lot to it. So let me just say it one last time. You cannot charge lithium iron phosphate batteries solely to a voltage. The situation where you're charging slowly and uh, you let the voltage come up 
above that really low voltage number, you're fully charged, but you kind of can't tell by voltage. We refer to that as low current overcharge. And it seems to be the number one killer of lithium iron phosphate batteries. And what's happening is you're over 100% charged, but since you're pushing so little current, you're not seeing this big voltage jump right away. And uh, it just kind of cooks the chemistry at above activation energy, but with no capacity to accept the power anymore. To do this right, I'll give you a little hint of how my device does it. I was a professional engineer for most of my life. Uh, I retired, you know, from engineering early. And I'm really good at solving these things. And this one was one of the harder problems I've ever had to solve. I needed to watch the voltage. I needed to watch the current. I needed to watch or remember um, the history of what the battery has been through. I needed to take timings on certain phases of what the battery was doing. I needed to do a few other things. I needed to put them all together with some multi-dimensional math. And it all has to be looked at in reference to each other because each one of the variables modifies the other variables. But I ended up with, um, a mat let's say mathematical software, a equation that uh, can, can look at the electrochemistry and model it. And it can model it very accurately. Um, every time I do a battery review, I charge the battery twice during the review. I may not say I do it, but every time to 100% with a bank manager. And then after that one time I overcharge it and I find that I'm right here at 100% because I see it go right into the hockey stick immediately. And then the second time I do it, I see that I'm at 100% because as the voltage and current and just plain amp hours come out of that battery, I'm counting them and you'll find that the batteries that are rated at 100 amp hours, I find like they have 104. Well, technically that's what they do. They overrate them, you know, they give you a little extra, you know, as just what they do when they build the battery cells. Um, but if I was finding it wrong, I'd find like 85, you know, if I wasn't charging completely. Let's say we have a magical way of charging this lithium iron phosphate battery to 100%. Safely, not to 100.1, but to 100%. What do we do to get the longest life out of it? The very first thing is to do just that. Be able to charge to 100% and not beyond 100%. This is a bit controversial. You'll find a lot of writings and people with strong opinions that you only charge to like 80%. Um, the, the, the video that I'm recommending, he kind of implies you should not charge to 100%. But remember, he has an automobile and he is plugging into the grid and he has more control over his world. So keep that under uh, advisement. Also, I think the main reason why the rule of thumb is not to charge to 100 is because the guy writing it kind of, you know, he knows he's doing a rule of thumb. He's just trying to give you guidance, not like trying to do a PhD thesis and, you know, how to charge batteries. He's assuming you have no way of stopping at 100. And it's better to stop at 80 than to go to 105. You really don't want to go beyond 100. So, but we're assuming we have a magic way of stopping at 100. So charge to 100. The biggest downside of not charging to 100% is lithium iron phosphates will develop a memory. And if you repeatedly charge them to the same point, over time, if you try to charge them to that point, they'll look like they're at 100%. Their voltages will start skying. They will act like they have less capacity than they really have. And for all purposes, well, you don't have the capacity. You can dial that back or your charge controller probably will end up dialing it back and eventually you lose capacity. If you manually charge them to 100%, just force them up, you are going way up into hockey sticks and all of that bad stuff, but you can recover. But no charge controller is gonna do that for you. Another thing that's very important um, and is don't ever charge a lithium iron phosphate battery that is frozen. Uh, if your BMS has protections, great. Otherwise, you have to find some other way to protect that battery. If it can be exposed to very cold weather and you charge it even a small amount when it's frozen, it will die. There's some ways of killing a lithium iron phosphate absolutely immediately that I'm not going to go into because all these batteries should have a BMS. And the BMS's job is, well, not to control charging of the batteries as many people think. It's just to keep them from 
immediately destroying uh, a cell because of a cataclysmic failure. And those failures typically happen because, well, the cell got too hot, the cell was overly charged, or the cell was charged to zero, discharged completely. So the BMS will keep those real border conditions from being able to happen by just shutting the battery right off. Um, that's not great for your use case, <laughs> but it certainly beats, you know, destroying. Anyway, I'm not going to go in this video into how to worry about those edge conditions. I'm just going to assume we all have a good BMS doing that job. Cycle depth. This one has like two right answers. Um, the battery itself would rather have a deep cycle and then be charged all the way up. Um, or even mostly up. But the, the battery does not like to hover from 100% down to 80% back to 100%. If you grabbed a bank manager and you looked at the default factory defaults, it would make it do just that. I mean, it would essentially try, make it a candidate for recharging as soon as it dropped below 80%. Of course, if you have a small battery bank and you're running all night off it, it's gonna come way down and then come back up again. But if you have a really big bank and you're not using all of it, it will tend to hover up in the top part. So you have to, as the user, decide do you want to keep the tanks full all the time and give up a little battery life? Or do you want to let the tanks go down and use the full range of the batteries knowing you might be trapped down low without a way of recharging the batteries? That's a decision you're going to have to make and hopefully add some tricks at the end that'll make that easier to do. Finally, temperature. Probably the single biggest reason that proper cruisers that go to the tropics are going to kill their batteries. I take my batteries where it's like 30, 35, occasionally 40 degrees Celsius. They want to be at like, what I think it's 23 degrees Celsius. Um, so I'm giving them a rough life and that probably since I'm doing everything electrically that can be done to make them do a good job, live a long life, um, that's probably the single biggest thing for me personally. So, you know, I could run air conditioning to cool my batteries, but that's diminishing return. I'm using more battery to do it, and I'm just not going to air condition my batteries. I air condition my bunk. Um, I could, uh, I don't know, circulate salt water. Eh, just too much work. My batteries are coming on vacation with me, and they are going to be treated like I'm treated, and if I'm sweating and it's affecting my life, it's going to affect theirs too. But don't do stupid things. Don't mount your batteries in your engine room if you're a boat that uses the engine a lot. If it's gonna be 50 degrees Celsius all around them all the time, well, you're really gonna know the difference. So just do what you can to keep them relatively cool. Keep the cells balanced. Um, if your cells are of different state of charge, let's say this guy's a, at uh, 80 and this guy's at 80 and this guy's at 100 and this guy's at 80. If I try to put in another 20%, this guy's gonna get well overcharged. He's gonna have problems. It's going to hurt him. He is in the hockey stick. He is up in the damaging area where the others aren't. How you do that is balance them. Now the BMS should balance the cells. I've been through a lot of BMSs in the last year. Um, I'm looking at the low end BMSs on the cheaper batteries, of course, but I'm finding that some of them don't balance for all purposes. Some of them balance incredibly slowly. Um, you've got to figure out how they balance at least conceptually for yourself. I've found um, that I've changed my opinion on uh, the whole Bluetooth thing. At first, I thought it was silly. I think I say in an early battery uh, review, you don't need Bluetooth, the, the cells don't care. Bluetooth is the only way you're gonna know what's happening on the individual cell level. And you can look at it and say, hey, I think you're out of balance. Now, let me tell you this, you're not gonna know they're out of balance until you overcharge the battery a bit. Get into that hockey stick. And if you're using proper charging methods, you may not actually get into the hockey stick as an aggregate of the whole batteries and your cells might go out of balance. So I'm telling you, bank manager users, occasionally you want to let the bank manager overcharge your batteries a bit. You want to look at what's happening and you want to decide if they need some time up there to balance the cells. In short, long life balanced cells. Now for how I do all this. This is the practical part. Um, all of this is the reason I, I developed this. If you don't know, this is my bank manager. 
It's a device for letting you, A, mix lithium and lead batteries together. In fact, it requires that you do that. But B, and probably way more importantly, it is the only thing out there that I've seen, and uh, tell me if I'm wrong, that charges the lithium bank the way that I've just described. It doesn't charge to a voltage. It certainly doesn't make them hang out up in the hockey stick. It will dynamically change the charge environment as necessary and shut off the lithium batteries when they're fully charged. If you get a Gen 3, which is the ones in the black case, uh, besides the bigger display and Bluetooth and all that, it has some other pins. And one of those pins is a load pin. You put that onto a load you supply. I usually just use a big old uh, power resistor to make some heat. And the bank manager will dump some of the power of a fully charged uh, battery to lower its voltage below that activation energy pretty quickly. And don't worry about the power that it's losing. In my case, I find it to be 0.07% of the total capacity of the battery. So it's negligible. But the point is, right after the full charge, I bring them right down. Okay, this is the only way I know to charge to 100% of capacity, not over that, not under that, in an actively operating system. Now, uh, the labs that do the cycle testing have a, a very good method of charging to 100%, but it isn't an active system. It's a system where they have complete control of the current going into the battery. And you can read the white papers on that if you'd like to, but um, it's not practical for us at all. We can't control the power going into the battery because A, loads come on and off, fridge might come on using up some power, and B, um, I'm assuming that you're using solar. Uh, what would be the point of having an off-grid system that you plugged into the wall all the time? And the sun, being the sun, um, has different angles to your panels, so it's putting out different current all throughout the day, and there are these things called clouds. So um, we can't control the incoming current. It's, that's what I define as an actively being used system, and this guy can charge to 100%. It has a reset button. Um, it knows when the battery has been recently fully charged, and until it drops down to a certain point, it will not make it a candidate for recharging again. Uh, you can set that anywhere you want to with this menu structure. Uh, by default, I set it at 80%, so when it drops below 80%, it's a candidate for recharge. That would be have it kind of sort of using the top 20, 30, 40%, depending on how long your night is. Uh, but if you had a big bank, you could set up the bank manager so it's not a candidate for recharge until it goes all the way down to, say, 20%. Just leave yourself enough to get through one night and you'll be fine. But what happens if that next day the clouds are everywhere and there's no sun? Well, before the clouds, you'd want to just push this button. And if you were at 50%, the bank manager would say, Oh, okay, candidate for recharge. And it'll immediately start a recharge cycle. In fact, somebody is working on a library for one of those Raspberry Pi home monitoring systems that's connected to the internet all the time to um, actually watch the future. And if it's going to be cloudy for a few days, it will tell the bank manager automatically, hey, reset, that guy's a candidate for recharge. So you can use those two together. Not out yet, but he's been calling me and asking for help. And uh, we decided that would be a really cool feature. The bank manager has a lot of settings in its menu, as I mentioned. Uh, one of them is charge two, and usually you set it charge to 100%, but you can dial that down if you wanted to. So if you only want to charge to 80%, it'll charge to more or less 80%. I'll uh, have the advantages that that has uh, if you're into that. I don't, I don't think it's a good idea personally. It'll have the downside. It'll start developing memory and all of that. It also has charge to voltage. Um, charge to voltage charges sort of like the Victron. Remember, I said you can't charge to voltage correctly with a lithium ion phosphate battery. I left that in for two reasons. One reason is I use a charge sensor that I don't make and I didn't know how reliable they were. Turns out they're pretty reliable. If they make it through the first week, they tend to work. Um, but anyway, if that were to fail or you had some wiring problem or something happened to that, uh, if you go to charge to voltage, you still have a working system and it's still better than the Victron approach because it has other features that let you occasionally charge high and then charge low and things like that. But um, the main reason that it's there is you can occasionally put it in that mode. 
you can let the battery come up. I would let it go up to 100% first using this in its normal mode. Then set it for charged voltage. Choose a fairly high voltage and the system will come back alive and you'll go up in the hockey stick. I would do whatever's necessary to really slow down the charge rate because that tends to be what BMS is like and your BMS can do its whole balance cycle. If you have a Bluetooth, you can watch, see what's going on and this is a way to let you up in the hockey stick when you want to. Uh, by the way, if you can't figure out how to lower the current coming out of your solar panels, may I suggest throwing a towel on them. It works really well. So there's that and there's lots of other menu parameters that will let you fine tune these things. If you're going to put your batteries in storage for a while, it's good to tell the bank manager, hey, I'm, uh, I don't want you to charge 100%. I want you to charge to some lower number and I don't want you to do another recharge cycle until it's quite a bit below 50%. And you'll have a system, you know, assuming you have solar panels or something actually making power, where the battery is going to be hovering around the middle of its um, uh, capacity. Uh, it'll still be there for bilge pumps and whatever other emergency or necessary things your boat or your system needs when you're not around. But it's assuming you're not running air conditioners and stoves and things. So it, you can set it up to dial to stay in the middle. And then you would get the most life if you're going to leave your batteries unattended for literally years. Um, if you're just going to leave for a month or so, just leave it the way it is. The Bank Manager Gen 3 has a thermometer you can plug into it. It comes with a thermometer. If you put that thermometer down where the batteries are, it can know the temperature in the battery compartment. Now, you, this goes to the whole don't charge lithium iron phosphate when frozen. Now that caveat is very important and do not charge your lithium iron phosphate when your batteries are frozen. It will destroy them. But that is best done with a good BMS. And a good BMS that shuts off the battery only from a charge point of view is great. Better if it takes the energy coming in and re-diverts it to a heating blanket and actually melts the batteries and keeps them warm. Excellent. Some of the better batteries do that. But if you have a battery that can't do either of those tricks and you think you might expose this battery to freezing conditions, even on occasion, if you're a camper person, really think about it either during winter storage or if you go up in the mountains and you have a solar panel, you could charge them in a frozen state pretty easily. Anyway, the bank manager does, you know, sort of a good job um, by trying to do what it can do. It will watch the temperature. It will shut off the lithium bank. And when the temperature comes back up a bit, it will turn back on the lithium bank. So I don't necessarily recommend it as what you do to solve the problem, but if you have no other way to solve the problem, it is so much better than not solving the problem. A lot of devices have a percent of charge meter that can watch what's going on. Your BMS will report, if you have Bluetooth, what the percent of charge of the batteries are. Your Victron system will watch and tell you the percent of charge of your batteries. This is all great. Bank Manager does it too. It's called a Colum counter, some French... Uh, electrochemist from way back when named Colum uh, came up with a method and we implemented. Uh, if it's implemented fully, it's actually pretty accurate for lithium. Uh, I think the bank manager is as good as any of them, but it has one great advantage. The other ones all wait until it sees the lithium battery voltage go way up into the hockey stick voltages. And when it does, it resets. It says, ah, that's like 14 and a half volts. It's fully charged. I'm going to mark it at 100%. If you don't routinely remark it at 100%, they drift and over time they will start giving you other numbers. The bank manager has an advantage that it has all that fancy math and it knows where 100% is without going into the hockey stick. It will reset its own column counter every time it does a charge cycle. Um, the net of that is if you put them all on and you finish a charge cycle and clear them all or charge over or do whatever you need to do to get them all in sync, go three days and they're right together. Go three months and the Victron and the BMS are going to start coming up with wrong numbers. And I say wrong because the bank manager really knows when to reset itself. It's not because it's column counter is better. It's simply because it knows how to correct itself better. Finally, um, if you wanted a big battery system, you want a big tank, you know, um, a lot of storage for energy, 
Um, it's got great advantages. I mean, you're cycling your batteries less. They will last longer because of it. Uh, it's just playing nice sometime to be able to go a long time without the sun charging. What you want to do if you've got a lot of lithium, um, if you can afford it, is to buy multiple bank managers. This gives you a couple advantages. First off, you can set the numbers pretty low, like 20% before it's a candidate for recharge. And let's say we have bank A, bank B, bank C. If they all coincidentally hit 20% at the same time, well, you might have a problem if you have a few cloudy days, but it's just unlikely. Most likely they get out of sync with each other. And this guy says, oh, I'm a candidate for recharge and, and charges all the way up. Well, this guy isn't taking power that day. And you know, like that. Uh, so it's a great way to solve that problem. It is also, by the way, a great way to solve a couple other issues. Lithium batteries should not be mixed. They act very differently as they get older and they act very differently if they're made differently. So if you have batteries from different manufacturers or of different ages, you shouldn't put them in a parallel bank, but you can put the, them in separate banks that are in parallel controlled by their own bank manager. And Temptress, I have three of these doing that for three different batteries of three different ages and three different manufacturer. If you buy some batteries and then a year later you say, I want more batteries. By rights, you should take your original batteries and like sell them to somebody else because they're fine, but they shouldn't be mixed with new batteries. And it's very likely that the deal that was the best deal a year ago isn't the deal that's the best deal now. So your new ones may be different. Uh, with Bank Manager, you can buy another Bank Manager, put your new batteries in and it's fine. Just let it go. Well, that's about all I have to say on charging lithium iron phosphate batteries. Uh, thanks for sitting through all of it. I know this one was probably deep and probably a little uh, confusing. I hope I did a good presentation. I'll know during editing, of course. But uh, that's about all I have to say on the subject. Thanks so much for watching. Uh, please subscribe, of course, if you haven't already. Uh, you'll see that my videos don't tend to be beaches and bikinis, especially lately. Um, so. What they are is um, evergreen videos about real science that we need to apply to our lives living off grid. So if you like this video, look through my back catalog. You'll find lots of other videos you like, I'm pretty sure. Bye from Clark on Campus.